Hi everyone, welcome to In Deep Geek Live. Uh, this is an open Q&A. Um, if you're confused about the, the timings, this is one of those odd weeks where some parts of the world have, uh, have changed their clocks back and other parts haven't, but you're here, so congratulations. Um, what we're going to be doing is just taking as many different questions as we can across all the different things that I cover. Most of the questions I've got are about uh, Song of Ice and Fire, House of the Dragon, but if you want to talk about um, Tolkien, Rings of Power as well, uh, The Witcher, other stuff, very happy to do that. A um, couple of things uh, just to say for first of all, and the main one is to say thank you. If you donated at all over the course of the seasons that uh, we've just had for Rings of Power and House of the Dragon, on both of them, my live streams all the way through uh, the season were in aid of Alzheimer's care and research, and we raised over $7,700, which is amazing. So thank you so much if you donated. If you missed out and would like to just go back to one of those videos that it's still open, you can still donate. But uh, I wanted to say thank you. It means a huge amount to me and it will make a massive difference. So uh, thank you very much. Um, I thought what we do though uh, to start off with is um, just uh, go to um, what we used to do before the seasons were on was just give a little bit of a high level flavor of some things going on in the wider world uh of sort of geeky tv shows and books um and uh morally uh just asked me just to give a little bit of an update on what's going on with a lot of different things so i'm very happy to do that um first of all the Game of Thrones spin-offs, we, we haven't had an update on this at all um i was hoping we might get one at the end of the House of the Dragon season, but we haven't. George R. Martin said nothing, so we're still waiting. I'm sure at some point soon we will get some information because they've been working on some of these for quite some time, and clearly House of the Dragon was a massive success, so surely they will do something, um, commission a couple of extra things, but we're just waiting on that. Westworld, which I'm a big fan of, um, we have not had any confirmation about season five. Season four, if you watched it, you'll know that that did reach some sort of a conclusion. Um, so I think that they probably will end it there. The The lack of an update probably um, doesn't bode well. Normally they confirm if they have decided not to. Uh, my take is that HBO, they've got quite a few things going on in the background to do with HBO Max and ownership and things like that, which does impact on where they're sort of going as a strategy. And also, they House of the Dragon was a massive gamble for them. It cost a huge amount of money to get that off the ground. And the fact that it's been such a success will impact on their content strategy going forward. So it may be that they're just taking a pause, having a think about this, and then we'll get an announcement. But I'm if I had to guess at the moment, probably not. Um, no news is probably bad news on that one. Sandman, however, um, we have just today had some excellent news. Season two will happen. Season two has been commissioned. It took them a long time, Netflix. Sandman was excellent um, and critically acclaimed by lots of different people as well. If you've not watched it, do watch it. A really good adaptation um, there. And... We've just, it, it took them a while, Netflix. There, there was a lot of justifications coming out for why it is big budget. Uh, they did have to go through a whole load of metrics there. It wasn't as big and huge a success as Bridgerton or Stranger Things or some of the other things like that. So they did have to have make a decision about it, but they are now, they are now there. Uh, season two is going to happen. So again, don't expect it for a couple of years, but it it is going to happen. Um, Wheel of Time um, is, uh, we've had season, season one happened obviously last year, season two has been filmed, they finished filming it in May of this year, it's gone a bit quiet since then, season three has been commissioned, so it is carrying on, season two will, ha will happen at some point soon, we randomly had uh, Dusty Wheel uh, in the chat a, a while ago, who, for those who don't know, if you're a Wheel of Time fan or looking for Wheel of Time channels, the Dusty Wheel is is like the hub for um, uh, Wheel of Time fans. Um, Matt there is a 
fantastic host uh, of the podcast and a YouTube channel. And I just asked him, when can we expect it? And he said, probably spring. So that's when we're expecting season two of The Wheel of Time. Good Omens season two, I think they finished filming now. Um, I don't know when that's happening, but it could be at some point in the next few months. I hope we haven't really had an update. His Dark Materials is, however, season three is, however, happening in December. So I did tweet out, I think, yesterday, a whole series of things to look out for over the coming months. Um, and uh, that's it. another one which, just to pick up, and is Willow. If you remember, or, or you saw it uh, after afterwards, back in... Uh, I'm guessing 80s, um, there was an epic fantasy film, but Willow, which was really good fun. And they've now made a uh, several decades later TV show sequel, which is happening later this month. So that's a thing to, I mean, I, I've not heard anything about this. I've seen the trailer, but I've not heard any good or bad things about it, but I will definitely give this a go and see what it's like. So that's something to, to keep an eye on. Um, let's go to um, uh, the chat. Um, my Sam uh, Hashemi saying we need more Lord of the Rings content, please. Yet, yeah, don't do not worry, the more Lord of the Rings content will be coming. Um, I actually had a new video about Mithril, which came out just yesterday. There will be uh, going forward a couple of Lord of the Rings videos a week, I would have thought. Uh, so, do not worry about that. Um, Andrew Kay saying, I did see a production company with links to George R. R. Martin took the Nymeria and Sea Snake shows off their list of scheduled projects. Not sure if it means anything. Yeah, I did. I've, I've asked about this. This was this caused some uncertainty because this was the, a, a list, not an official HBO list, but this was sort of like a third party list of things they're taking forward. And they both of those two potential spin-offs, the Nymeria one and the Sea Snake one, were on there before and then weren't on there. Does that mean anything? It might, but then again, it might not. It could simply be uh, a, a bureaucracy error. It could simply be that the people in charge of taking them forward are now another company. We don't know. So um, I'm not going to put too much weight on that yet. I'm, I'm waiting for something official from either HBO or George R. R. Martin on uh, the spin-offs. Um, Beppen saying, I liked Westworld season four. Uh, too bad it didn't seem to have much of an impact. Uh, they might have gone overboard with how convoluted season three was. Um, yeah, I mean, I think uh, I... Well, Philip P PLC saying, uh, or Philip LC saying, uh, RIP Westworld season four was awful. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it got mixed reviews. I enjoyed it still. Uh, I do like Westworld, but it, Westworld season one was one of the finest seasons of TV I have ever seen, and each season has been sort of for me a slight increment down. So I think they would have to push it back up again um, uh, for season five. And, and also the ratings also came down each season, which is obviously not a good sign uh, because that's what generates the cash for companies like HBO. Um, Billy Con saying, do you think the ending of the Rings of Power would be the last battle we will see Isildur falling for greed after cutting Sauron's hand off? Uh, well, just on a technical point, I did a video here about I think Isildur is... Um, it was done much wrong by Peter Jackson. Um, he, uh, when you actually get that scene, which we all remember, and he takes the ring, and then I was there when the, the strength of man failed, and all of this, this, and then later on, Arwen reassuring Aragorn that he's not, he's not Isildur. Um, that is, uh, that's not what happened in Tolkien. Uh, yes, Isildur did take the ring, but after having it for a year, he decided to get rid of it. Um, he was en route to Elrond. He was en route to Rivendell when what we saw happen, the orcs uh, ambushed, ambushed him and the ring took the opportunity to escape his finger. Now, that actually, I think, tells us that Elrond was a stronger person than we often give him credit for, because how many people, having got the ring, then actively move to get rid of it? Not not huge amounts, it has to be said. So, at, but as, as to your main point, the last scene, well, the showrunners of Rings of Power say they know what the last scene is already, which seems to imply that they're um, 
it's probably something big and impressive that they're building towards. Yes, probably that last scene if it's where Sauron has the ring cut from his hand and then sort of um, is vanquished for an age. That, I think, is probably where they'll end it, but who knows? It's a long way away still. Um, question from uh, username redacted saying, could the Thens be the first instance of a civilized wildling culture? The production of bronze weapons implies a complex society. Will the new house then create a new Bronze Age-esque civilization? Um, this is quite interesting. So the Thens, yeah, they're one of the wildling tribes. And the wildlings as a whole, just to take one step back, it's very noticeable that this is obviously something that the, um, the southerners, the people south of the wall, call the wildlings as if they're all, all the same. Uh, but that's not what the fro free folk think they are in lots of different groups and tribes and cultures and in different areas with different traditions and different civilizations so yes um th there are some that are probably getting to be quite developed is this going to lead to advances in the future um i think realistically um what we're looking at is the pool of knowledge with the maesters and that is the key thing we've got here if that survives the end of a song of ice and fire that is going to be the thing which is driving progress um yes different bits of the world can invent different things and have different technological breakthroughs but the maesters know all of that they just choose not to share it um i did see um in the chat a little bit earlier actually sir hunt's reviews hi there uh, mark great to see you if you do not know sir hunt's reviews he was on this channel uh part way through uh, house of the dragon for one of my live streams uh and uh, yeah i will happily uh come onto your channel i'm very much looking forward to it um uh probably some point later this month uh we will sort something out so um yeah something to look forward to uh i'm sure one of the moderators will put a link to his excellent channel in the chat um uh, M94, do you think John will become a dragon rider like his mother? Um, yeah, I think he will become a dragon rider. Um, uh, John Snow, uh, like his mother, well, his mother's Liana, so no. Um, uh, Tatafix saying, is that the same actor in the background? Yes, it is. If you didn't know this, um, the actor Robert Arameo, who plays Elrond, was also young Ned Stark. So um, it's quite a good couple of characters to be starting your career with, to be honest, Ned Stark and then Elrond. So um, yeah, I think he's um, I think he's done well. And w one thing I've heard about him, incidentally, for Tolkien fans, is that he was apparently the person who was most into the books and the lore and the legendarium uh, during filming of season one. And he was the person who most often try to bring people back to the text. And I think that probably showed in his portrayal. I think that he, of all of the um, characters that we're seeing younger versions of, I think his is the one that feels most right to me um, as Elrond. So uh, yeah, I'm, I've got a lot of time for him. I think he's, I think he's done good. Let's go to... Um, Oh, a question from Jibba Doll. This is from last week. I did, um, last week the chat was going through very quickly and uh, I did, uh, I, I thought I probably missed one or two super chats as they whizzed through and I said I would come back to them this time. So I've gone through all the super chats from last time. I think, I think the only one that I actually missed was Jibba Doll's. Um, so if you did ask a super chat last week and I didn't get to reply to it, just let the moderators know and they'll bring it to my attention. But um, uh, Jibba Doll says, congrats on 500k. Thank you very much. Um, I would love to know your favourite moment in A Song of Ice and Fire. Mine is John and Ghost looking at the stars before he climbs the wall. Um, I thought about this for a lot longer than I probably should have done because I, I, I realised that there are so many moments but the things that i like the most tend to be chapters or or particular bits in a, a character's arc i love for example Tyrion on the shy maid when he's on the uh, the boat um 
um, going down the River Rhine um, and with a whole bunch of people he doesn't know and one after another figuring out who they are psychologically as well as in, in disguise. Um, and that I just, that's one of my favorite little arcs. Um, but I think the, if I had to pick a moment, the obvious moment is obviously the Red Wedding that had a huge impact on me when I first read it. But there's also in book one, Game of Thrones, there's, um, part, I mean, I don't know, maybe a, a third of the way, a quarter of the way into the book, there are a couple of chapters back to back. I think they're Sansa 2 and Eddard 3, something along those lines. It's when they're on the King's Road. And you remember the scenes um, when you get uh, Joffrey out there with Sansa and then there's uh, um, Micah, the, the, the kitchen boy, and we get uh, the butcher boy and you get playing with Arya and then Nymeria gets involved and... Um, uh, bites Joffrey and everything that follows on from that, and there's there's a bit at the end. Once we followed all of this action through these two chapters, um, and you reach this moment where Ned he finally he accepts what he's going to do, and he goes off, and he stays for a moment or two with Lady the Direwolf before he executes her himself, and that. I didn't pick up on this the first time, but the second time through, it just really made me realize how much that that scene, those two chapters encapsulate the way that George R. Martin was writing that entire book. Because this was in itself a mini tragedy in a classical sense, a situation where all of the characters following who they are led to some inevitable bad ending and you could just see it coming out through the end at the end of it some somebody has to be beheaded and they're innocent and that it was lady the uh, the direwolf in that instance but that is then expanded out to what happens at the end of the story somebody has to be beheaded because of the characters because of what joffrey's like but because of what cersei's like um because of what sansa's like because of what ned is like all of these interactions of characters mean that that was always inevitable and he showed us this on a small scale before showing us on a larger scale it is we often talk about foreshadowing but this is foreshadowing of the structure of the book as a whole, uh, which is really quite a, a feat. Um, and that moment when he's there and Ned, he just accepts it, but he's just showing love in that moment. That That is, uh, that's the moment that I just thought on second read through, wow, this guy's good. I love these books. So that, that would be my sort of, favorite moment of a song of ice and fire um roman lakovitz uh saying is little finger or varis better at the game of thrones little finger definitely seems to have the advantage as of right now well this is an interesting one so they it depends what you count as better at it um so little finger thus far in A Song of Ice and Fire, the point we've got to is that he has he has set himself up to be um, each step to be gaining more power and he's gaining more power and he's gaining more power and you can see where he's going with this all the way through. I, I think he will end up not unlike, it won't be the same as on the show, but not unlike the show, when he gets to the north, he will suddenly find himself like a fish out of water in this an echo uh, a reflection of what ned was like when he came from winterfell down to king's landing and it was just this isn't his world and of course he's going to die at the end of it um you get little finger up in the north in winterfell and he is going to be out of his element and he will die at the end of that so i think little finger although yes he is um incredibly good at getting the things he wants. I think that his problem was that he always wanted the next step. He always wanted more, and that was always going to be a problem. And he was starting to leave these loose hanging threads. Um, 
so Sansa knows too much now, but he's got a, a weakness that means that he is allowing her to live because he wants her to be on his side. Um, Varys, on the other hand, is now acting in the shadows, and it's he has this plan. We've not yet seen how the plan's going to play through exactly. How will he come unstuck? I suspect he will purely come unstuck because of dragons. I think that's what it is. It's not through him not playing the game well. I think it's simply going to be dragons, which is going to be the problem for him. So who works it best? I think they both have their own strengths and they're both achieving what they want to achieve, but neither will ultimately win. Um, uh, Scott Chomitsky saying, um, how or did Tolkien describe how the wizards came to Middle Earth? Yet they arrived by boat and Kirdan met them in the Third Age, about the year 1000 of the Third Age. Um, so let's go to a question from Diego Godoy saying, Hola, Robert. Hola. I'm re-watching House of the Dragon, and I had a question. Does Otto know that Myceria is the White Worm? And if yes, when does he learn it? Did he know it when he was informed that Rhaenyra and Daemon were seen in a pleasure house in episode four? Thanks. So um, this is a question which came up at the time. I can remember being asked it in one of my live streams. So the gap between um, Otto meeting her very briefly on that bridge at Dragonstone and when he meets her again in King's Landing that's actually in book time I don't know the exact thing off the top of my head but about 20 years or more maybe even quarter of a century this is a long period of time so he probably won't remember her specifically that that is who that character is in terms of did he know who the white worm was when he got that information about what was going on um, with Rainier and Damon back in episode four, I think he just knew this came from the White Worm and he knew that this was good information because it came from her. So that's that's what it is. And he never met her personally to the, to the point where when we got to episode nine, he was double checking. Are you, are you the white worm? So you're the white worm, right? And that's the that's it was always done through intermediaries. So does he know that this is Damon's ex? Probably not. I mean, maybe he will figure it out. Maybe he will remember. But there's a lot going on at this moment in the story. So I, probably he won't. Um, will he know that that's the same person who helped him out in episode four? Yes. But he didn't know who that person was. Um, let's go to... Uh, oh, Swagger Dagger, actually, good point. Otto could have just been trying to play it off like he didn't know who she was solely for Eric and Eric's sake. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that's it's, it's possible, but as I say, this is 25 years, so he, the chances of him remembering that are quite limited, I think. Um, uh, Constantine Tran was saying Larry Strong is similar to Littlefinger. Is his death at the hands of the Starks a foreshadowing of Littlefinger's fate going up against the Starks? Um, so his fate against with the Starks is he will Larry Strong book spoilers. Um, I try to say this every time. Show spoilers are not okay on this channel. Book spoilers, the books have been out for a while. Book spoilers are okay. The show may or may not stick to what it says in the books. So Larys Strong gets executed by Craig and Stark at the end of The Dance of the Dragons. Now, is this foreshadowing for what happens with Littlefinger? I mean, I don't think we've seen yet that Larys is a clear analogue for Littlefinger. Yes, he's got a sort of a cre creepy obsession uh, with somebody, and yes, he sort of operates in the shadows, but he's closer to the Varys kind of Master of Whisperers figure. And he doesn't, at the moment, seem to have personal aspirations. We certainly haven't seen it in season one. Maybe we'll see more of that in time. But yes, he's now uh, Lord Strong, he's Lord of Harrenhal, but after that, what does he want? Does he actually want to be... 
uh, more powerful. Littlefinger always wanted more power. We've not seen it. So I don't think at the moment the analogs are that strong that we can say it definitely would be foreshadowing. Uh, Jerry Foot saying, on a scale from bad to horrible, how terrible was Rings of Power? I enjoyed Rings of Power. Um, I will, uh, I mean, I, I, I said this a few times. I've got a, a very long Twitter thread, which uh, I keep on meaning to post, setting out all my thoughts on the Rings of Power. Uh, but this is one of those uh, modern life is rubbish moments that, is that I've written it twice, going through like, saying, these are the things I like, these are the things I didn't like. Um, and both times my computer has shut down and I've lost it and, and I didn't, I'd forgotten to save it. So I, I've started rewriting it again. I will at some point go through it. Um, so I, I tend not on this, just my own personal views, I tend not to just sort of say something was great or something was terrible. Uh, my views on Rings of Power are nuanced. Uh, my views on many things are nuanced. I think that it, I enjoyed it. I think that there were some amazing things in there. I loved a lot of the visual landscape. Uh, I thought Casa Doom looked fantastic. I thought the two trees, I defy any Tolkien aficionado to see the two trees and not get a shiver down their spine. Um, some things there were amazing. I loved the music, Ben McCreary's music I thought was fantastic. Um, I thought uh, Adar was a great character. I thought that the relationship going on with Elrond and, uh, and Durin and Durin's family, that, was, that felt Tolkien-like. There were things I did not like as well. I think that the structure I did not like it, it wasn't a way that Tolkien ever wrote stories, and that's why it didn't feel very Tolkien. Um, it also led to quite a lot of changes that I think were unnecessary, um, which means it overall has this feel of a missed opportunity. I know loads of people who enjoyed the show um, who aren't Tolkien fans who came in and just liked the show, and if this introduces them to Tolkien, then great. I'm loving it. Um, my, my kind of pithy feel is that if this could have been so much better when you've got the greatest source material known to humanity when you've got the biggest budget known to humanity i i was hoping for the greatest show known to humanity which was never going to happen but um this if if they had told Tolkien's story in Tolkien's way i think that would have worked better than what they've done there's still uh four more seasons and i'm i'm filled with hope for it Um, Mark O'Brien saying I'd give Rings of Power a 6 out of 10. They can turn the season 2 around with no mystery boxes and better directors. I uh, didn't like Wayne Chi Yip's episodes much. Um, and uh, Mike Boyce saying um, Laris and Littlefinger with both Lords of Harrenhal. Yes, there is that echo definitely there. Michael Mertig saying, I'm looking forward to Willow, and I'm glad you mentioned his Dark Materials. Was wondering if it was coming back. It, it is. Um, I also enjoyed Wheel of Time, but I did not read the books. There's a lot of books, so do not worry about that. Um, I completely understand. Um, uh, and Mystery Box, actually, one, one thing I will say, just while we're on uh, Rings of Power, because this is something which I think a lot of the, the phrase Mystery Box um, gets banded around a lot and i think i just want to clarify that this isn't saying there should be no mysteries uh, mysteries are fine mysteries are good there's no problem with having mysteries i enjoy having mysteries in tv shows this is a specific storytelling structure which jj abrams particularly likes he adopted it for something like lost the idea is that the the viewer is placed in in the middle of a mystery which means that we have to work our way out in all directions and that's the key point it's not just we go through the story and as the story develops we understand what's going on it's uh, we have to try and figure out what had happened beforehand what was going on right at that moment in time where where and when are we in time who are these people here um uh, and each time an extra layer is um is revealed and it's we're looking out for clues and we should, therefore, at the end of all of this, be able to go back and start again. And it feels like a different experience going through because you know what's really going on. And that will then uh, give you a different viewing experience. So that is the, the mystery box approach. Um, and that is broadly what they try to do with season one of uh, Rings of Power. And 
that's not when i say that's not how tolkien tended to write because tolkien tended to just i mean as we know we've all read or seen uh lord of the rings the hobbit chapter one or two gandalf comes in and says here's the plot there's a, a dragon and a, and a a mountain we need to go there and kill the dragon and, and get the dwarves back go and then you're carried along with the the storyline and you're carried along with the characters and you're carried along by the world Lord of the Rings, Gandalf says, that ring there, it turns out that's a mega evil, powerful ring. It needs to be destroyed. We need to head off. Um, uh, I'll meet you, meet you there kind of thing. That's the, and then go. And then the plot just goes on from that point. And your the characters and the world and the story takes you along. It's not a, a mystery box. He tells us what things are right at the beginning. Um, uh, based man saying, uh, asking what will happen in Rings of Power season two, um, how much will it cover, etc. Now, I assume that this will cover the forging of the Rings of Power, the other Rings of Power. They seem to have done them the opposite way around to Tolkien, so they forged the three elven rings. He still needs to forge, um, the 16, which will be. Eventually, they'll become the nine for, for men, the seven for dwarves, and also the, the one ring that will probably lead to the the war of the elves and Sauron. And um, I don't know, may, maybe the forging of the one ring will, will happen at some point in the season. Maybe we will end with the distribution of the rings. I'm not sure, but that's the sort of the general scope of it. We've got Sauron now. We've got the big antagonist. Uh, the other rings will have to be forged. Um, Nate Davis saying, I thought Rings of Power started off a little slow. I wasn't a fan of the identity of Meteor Man, but I think he has huge potential. Excited to see Sauron unleash chaos. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the big thing. Now we've got the antagonist. Um, uh, and that does allow us to have a more normal style storyline. Um, uh, Let's go to a question from George R. R. Oh, actually, no, uh, George R. R. Tolkien. I should say that because I always write down that this is a username George R. R. Tolkien. I always write down George R. R. Martin because my fingers, uh, muscle memory always starts typing that. Anyway, Shasha saying, Hi, Robert. Hope all is well. I have a couple of book questions I kept inside during the shows. In the end, what is more important to Littlefinger? Power? or Sansa? If he found Sansa to plot against him, will he retaliate or shut his eyes and not want to see? Well, this is a really interesting question. So, and I would love to know what people in the chat feel here. It, it was um, it was definitely not Sansa to start with because he hadn't met Sansa until we get to, to book one. And actually, I think it's Sansa three perhaps maybe Sansa two I can't remember when she's there in the um watching the tourney you see it from her POV and she doesn't know who this person is and this guy comes up and it's really good if you go back and read it it's fascinating because he sort of comes in and just like stares at her and then just like mutters a few incomprehensible things and then just walks off and it's like who's that guy and you can tell that he's just been completely thrown by this person who looks like cat because really he's obsessed by cat and this is him just projecting that now on to sansa so i think it's that the answer which may sound like a cop out but i don't think it is is that in little finger's mind sansa and power they just go hand in hand that's that's not a um uh it's not an either or for him he just thinks he can have both um and he's got this huge self-confidence that he can actually make things happen would he in order to save his own life would he kill sansa probably he would i think but i think that he thinks he can have both and i think that's the kind of power that he wants it's not just power for himself he wants power ruling with sansa Um, let's go to a second question from Shah Shah saying, what will happen to the hundred and the hundred men Cersei had Kyburn sent to the wall in order to kill John? This was 
sort of a, a throwaway thing in a small council meeting. Um, they are sitting there trying to figure out what what do they do about Stannis. And Stannis has gone to the wall and they go, well, is they've got a new Lord Commander up there at the wall. Uh, this is Jon Snow's, uh, uh, Ned Stark's bastard son. And then Cersei's there going, well, you know, obviously he will side with Stannis. And they think, what are we going to do? And she says, well, I'm just not going to send them any more people then. I'm not going to send any more people up to the, the Night's Watch. That would just be giving them more power. And then Kyburn says, well, we could deliberately send some people up there in order to assassinate John, basically. And uh, one of the Kettle Black Twins, I forget which one, the idea was that he would be sent off to head this uh, this sort of commando unit up to the wall to become Night's Watch members. What happened to it? It just kind of got lost uh, by she got caught up in the High Septon um, business and uh, the Kettlebacks did too. So it just got that plan just got shelved, basically. Winter then did start falling in the north. And so as far as anyone's concerned, that's actually no longer a, a, the big threat. The big threat for Cersei, her mind is very, what's the immediate threat here? Her mind then was what's going on with the High Septon and what's going on with the Tyrells. So that's what happened. It basically just got shelved. The irony, of course, here is that she was going to send people to assassinate John. She didn't have to. She didn't have to. The Night's Watch were going to do it anyway. She wanted to have people in the Night's Watch who would assassinate John. There was no need. In. The third question, Shasha, uh, saying, how much magic is there in prophecy? Does it follow the intent or sacrifice rule? I can, for example, see the intent, but not the sacrifice in the prophecy of the Dosh Kaleen. So the, the intent so, slash sacrifice rule, this is something uh, that I've I've talked about before, is that George Martin is, is vague, deliberately vague about his magic system. He doesn't he doesn't like the idea of having a magic system that you can uh, easily quantify something that feels like it's just sort of like a scientific formula where you have to do this, then this, then this, and then that's the result you get from it. He wants magic to be not easily understood, not easily controlled. He what doesn't want you to be able to understand how it works. He thinks that adds a little extra layer of the scary to it. And I think that's I think that's right. I, I completely understand it. And but what he does do, because for almost any magic system to work, it does have to have some sort of a cost attached to it. Otherwise, suddenly a magic user could just do anything. So there, there is a sacrifice involved and there seems to be some sort of intent in almost every single um, instance of magic in George R. Martin's world. You have some sort of sacrifice or cost and some sort of intent and sometimes these things are obvious we must have king's blood that's the sacrifice and sometimes it's very clearly i'm now trying to do some sort of a spell um what about prophecy though specifically the dosh kaleen's prophecy about danny or danny's uh, unborn child the intent is clearly there the idea if you take your mind all the way back to partway through book one, Game of Thrones, the idea is that uh, she arrives in Face Dothrak and then the Dosh Kaleen sort of mutter prophecies over. They, they see a vision. The, the leader of the Dosh Kaleen sees a vision in the smoke. They all throw reeds onto this uh, brazier and she looks into the smoke and then she pronounces the vision and she pronounces uh, the prophecy for this child. And the prophecy comes out that he, he will be the stallion who mounts the world. And the, the person who gives this is visibly shaking. This is, again, it's wonderfully well written because this is not just a, a, a process which has gone through um, that uh, they just say the same standard thing every time. This was not what the Dosh Kaleen were expecting to see. This was not what they're wanting. And they're actually genuinely scared of what they saw. So um, that does seem to be some sort of magical thing. You say intent is there. Yes, I would agree. Clearly there's some intent. Is there sacrifice? Well, there was some sacrifice and this was a sacrifice of a wild stallion. 
this uh, follows on immediately from, and it's part of the same ceremony, when Danny's eating the horse's heart. And so that is the sacrifice, the, the wild stallion. And that sounds like not much. But to the Dosh Kaleen, the, the stallion is, this is life. This is this is the heart of their culture, and a wild stallion, one that's untamed. This is a huge sacrifice. So yes, I think that that does meet those kind of. I mean, they're they're not rules uh, because they do get broken. There is. I still haven't quite got my head round um, Beric's first resurrection. That that doesn't seem to. Uh, meet these rules at all. Um, just having a quick flick through the chat. Um, uh, Kaziglu Bay saying, uh, Tony Teflon did a video about that and looked gnarly, definitely a dragon baby. If you're talking there about, I mean, I've not seen that video. Um, uh, I'm sure Tony did a great job on it. Um, if you're talking about the the dragon baby, Rhaenyra's baby that she gives birth to, a tragic stillborn baby in episode 10. Uh, in the book, there were rumours that this was draconic, scaly, wings, but a hole in its heart. This is a horrible uh, baby. Um, they have now shown us the... Uh, the model that they used for this. I think I tweeted it out, actually, if you're interested, so do go and have a look at that. It's it's very clear that it's not, it's not a dragon. It is a baby, but it is a draconic baby. It's got scales, the nose is, is uh, slitted in a kind of a dragonish way. Um, the, the features are kind of drawn back. This is... Uh, this is like that. It's not quite as far gone as the what the maesters told us in Fire and Blood, which is fine. The maesters do not always tell us the truth in Fire and Blood, but that's where they're at. So um, I wish there'd been more light in that scene that would have allowed... I mean, it would have been pretty grim, but um, uh, it would have allowed us to see it on the show. But watching, seeing it afterward, then we can clearly confirm that. Um Andrew K saying, with more information coming about the Dragon Baby since the last House of the Dragon episode, seems one of the few times Mushroom's accounts have been used on House of the Dragon. Yeah, Mushroom's accounts have not generally been um, uh, very useful so far. They've not been lent on all that much. George R. R. Tolkien saying, salutations, Robert, salutations to you. I have a multi-question about Fire and Blood. The first was about the big reveal of Aegon's dream. Did it change your outlook on the whole story? Because as I go through the books again, it really connect. As I go through the books again, it really connects everything, especially Maegor's constant obsession with making an heir. Also, I was confused on who told Jaehaerys the dream. And lastly, I wanted your thoughts on Septon Moon. Do you believe he was uh, killed by the faceless men? Um, right. So a few things there. So Aegon's dream. I've got another question about this coming up later. But um, in terms of the how it got down to Viserys, this is quite an interesting one because it does seem to be just passed on from air to air. But the the Targaryens very very rarely have a normal just handover of power to the obvious heir. Aegon's uh, a niece, Aegon's first son, did take over relatively peacefully from Aegon, uh, but then when he died, Maegor just claimed the crown from his son. Um, and so that line was broken. Um, and then when Maegor died, Jaehaerys grabbed the throne from instead of his named heir, who was Arya Targaryen. So how did the prophecy come down? Well, I think Aegon didn't just have it himself. I think it seems reasonably clear that this was something that probably both his sisters knew about as well. I'm pretty sure Visenya at least knew about this. 
And if the senior knew about it, she will have passed it on, pardon me, to Magor. So Magor himself will have had it. Magor, when he um, announced his heir as being Eria, who was incidentally uh, previously um, uh, heir as well, so um, sort of next in line, uh, she may well have already heard it, but he probably will have told her, and then Jeheris will probably have heard it from her. So um, that seems to be the, the line it uh, went down there. Um, does it make sense of Magor's constant obsession with making an heir? Yes, it does. He he married six times, desperate to have an heir, but it never quite worked. The rumour was that this was because he was only um, there because of some dark magic that Visenya came up with. Um, so it makes sense that he was wanting his child, but it also makes sense that... Um, he generally would have wanted this child to take over from him. Um, in terms of Sept and Moon, this is uh, something, if you've not read uh, Fire and Blood, you probably won't be aware of Sept and Moon, but he's uh, a fascinating character, and he appears right at the end of Magor the Cruel's reign. And he's basically this rabble-rousing Faith of the Seven preacher who... Um, gathers people around him and starts a revolution. And they, those people around him, all proclaim him the true High Septon. The High Septon himself at the time was pretty weak and ineffective. But um, Septon Moon was absolutely anti-Targaryen, uh, which is understandable under Maegor because Magor was pretty horrific. But Magor died, Jeheris took over, and Septon Moon hung around. And he, he was camped with his small army outside Old Town. And Jeheris had to decide what to do about this, because it had to be dealt with. And so they're discussing what they, they're going to do, and they decide, we'll, we'll just send the dragons in. Um... But Septon Moon, who was this, this great character, he's he pretends to be great and pious, but in reality he seems to be uh, quite a uh, quite a drunkard, um, uh, and has a new woman brought to his tent every day, um, that kind of thing. And he gets assassinated before the Targaryens can arrive there with the dragons. He gets assassinated. Now, who could have done this? Was it King Jaehaerys and co? It doesn't seem likely because they sent the dragons. Why would they need to hire someone to do the assassination? Um, there are a few other characters that are sort of in and around that camp who perhaps had a uh, an incentive to try and do it, but the real people who will have wanted this to just go away were the High Towers. This was outside their city. The dragons were coming, and uh, they will be the Targaryens will be livid that the High Towers hadn't dealt with this before. But the High Towers didn't want to be upsetting the people, so they didn't want to be associated with it. But they did want Septon Moon dead. Now, how he died was uh, this uh, young woman comes to his tent with a big pitcher of wine and says, "I I need your help." Uh, Septon Moon, and he says, of course, come in. And then sometime later, she runs out from the tent screaming. Then he comes out a bit after that with his throat cut, and he dies. Now, obviously, the thinking was, who's this woman? She must have done this. But actually, that doesn't quite add up, because what's, what happened was that this pitcher of wine that she brought was poisoned. So she does seem to have been an assassin, but um, her assassination attempt was to get him to drink lots of wine and poison him. Now, why maybe that just went wrong? Maybe he made a move and she didn't like it and she had to um, uh, get, get a knife out or something. It's possible. But actually, my instinct is that 
there was a second assassin. She was there trying to murder him with um, wine, but then somebody else managed to get into the tent, and that's why she screamed and ran out, because she witnessed a murder, um, and the real assassin disappeared. Could it have been a faceless man? Very possibly, um, because we just simply do not know. Um, and it was done in a way that made everybody suspect the woman. Um, whereas the real assassin probably got away with it. Um, so who was it? Actually, I don't think it matters. Huge, huge amounts who actually did it. I think that the people behind it were the high towers, and I think that's the main point now. Um, Michael Stein saying, I just rewatched your Lord of the Rings from Sauron's perspective video. I was wondering, does Sauron consider himself evil? The same question could apply to any evil characters. Do they realize that they're evil? Well, no, I think is the short answer. And this is, I mean, George R. R. Martin often quotes, and I forget where this comes from originally, it was someone like Hemingway, um, that everyone is a hero in their own story. So that's something George R. R. Martin is a big fan of. And Tolkien also wrote in this way, Sauron did not think I'm just this evil person who has to take over the world and be bad. He thought that the world needed order. And he thought that he could bring order to the world. And so that was his motivation. They did try to bring a bit of that out in the Rings of Power. Um, but this was, yeah, this was his motivation. He thought that he could order the world in a way that no one else could. So he didn't think he was evil. He thought that he was just doing the right thing. Pardon me. Um, if I'm yawning more than usual, it was just I had my COVID booster jab yesterday and, and always after those things I get, it completely wipes me out. So I do apologize for that. Um, Connor Cunningham saying, got here late. What are your thoughts on Henry Cavill leaving The Witcher? Concerned it could lead to an early end to the show. Yeah, so I talked about this a little bit on my Sunday live stream, but I'm very happy to talk a bit more. I've had a little bit more time to think about this. Um, it's... There, there is, again, I tweeted out um, Redanian Intelligence, which is a great website for information on what's going on with, with The Witcher. They were digging back through the history of this because this was not new. This wasn't just something that he woke up in the morning and thought, you know what? I want to quit. I want to move on. And they've gone through the things that he's said in the past. He started out being committed to this for five seasons. And then we, if you remember the, after season one, one of the things it was, I liked season, everybody liked season one, I think, of The Witcher. Uh, but one of the things that he was saying after that was that he was pushing for the character of Geralt to be more reflective of the book character of Geralt. And, by, and, and I completely agreed with him because the, the TV show version of Geralt was quite monosyllabic grunting, going, uh, uh, occasionally just swearing. Um, in the books, Geralt is uh, loquacious. He's eloquent. He's well-read and learned. He has deep philosophical discussions with people a lot of the time. Um, and he's not just this stupid fighter who's just going around and, and killing monsters. And Henry Cavill wanted a bit more of that. And I and many other people thought, great. This is good. This is him engaging with the character. This is him trying to bring it back to the good, the, to the books. Great work. Then um, we get uh, towards the end of season two. So he initially signed up for, although he said he was wanted to do all five seasons, he initially only signed up for season two. Um, uh, as far as season two, um, he started making a few comments about when people were asking him about how long do you want to do this? And he was saying things like, as long as we can keep on creating a TV show with stories that are reflecting these great books, um, which seemed to be just a, yeah, he's just wanting to keep this up. But looking back, it feels a little bit closer to being a, um, not quite an ultimatum, but actually this is what he was saying to the people. And they offered him a big pay rise and he, he stuck around for season three. But now he's um, clearly reached that point. We've had rumours of other, some parts of the writing room didn't like the source material. It's 
and now he's he's moved on and yes he's got another gig to go to he's clearly an in-demand actor he's got superman maybe there's other things as well he's previously said he could do superman and the witcher at the same time so that is actually not the reason he went he didn't go because of superman he wanted to do the witcher but he there was something around the witcher that he's he seems to have lost heart about which does make me concerned about Witcher season three. I don't know anything much about it. We, I know it's supposed to be based on Time of Contempt, book three. You will, um, sorry, book two. Uh, you will, if you're, um, if you're book fans, you'll know season one very broadly covered a lot of the short stories and did that reasonably accurate. There were some changes, but you know, broadly speaking, season two. A lot of there were a lot of changes. The the central Voleth Mir storyline was completely new, and so they did shift around a lot. That didn't none of that um had potential knock-on effects, which would necessarily mean that season three would have to be completely different, but perhaps it will. Perhaps they are going to be shifting even further than books. So my thoughts are. I'm concerned. Um, I he he seems to have left in a, a way so as he's not crashing and burning the franchise or anything like that. He could have said some bad things. Um, he timed his departure at the same time for it to be an announcement about who his replacement was going to be. So he's still playing nice there, um, but clearly it's not just a matter of he's got a Superman gig. So I'm concerned, but I'll wait and see. Um, Uber Mellon saying, Hi, Robert. If we were to assume that either Mushroom or Eustace and Munken were 100% correct about what happened, which would make a more interesting story? Interesting is obviously Mushroom, I think. Uh, so for those who haven't read Fire and Blood, it's written as a history book with a number of sources, and these sources are other people who've written accounts of what happened at the time. And you get Septon Eustace, who is this rather pious character. <coughs> Pardon me. You get um, Munken, who's a maester, and he's written a history book. And uh, and also, which is also a, a both of them are sort of trying to justify their own role. And then you get Mushroom, who's just written this, what seems to be a bawdy comedy of what was going on at the time. And his stories are always the best stories. They're always the most scandalous stories. They're always the least believable stories, but they're the most fun stories. So his would be a, a better one, but um, I mean, it would definitely need to be a, a for adults only, but um, it would make for a riveting story, I think. Um, I think that's me caught up in the chat. Let's go to a question from Alejandro Martinez saying, quick House of the Dragon question. In episode seven, we see Aemond tell Alicent and the rest of the family gathered at Griffmark that losing an eye to claim Vagar was a fair exchange. Yet we later see Aemond taunt and threaten Lucerus to take out one of his own eyes to even the score, so to speak. Is this cognitive dissonance? Well, to a degree, yes. But there are two completely different points in time. So him saying um, it was worth it, basically, at the time, I think is that's a sort of a spiteful, is to say uh, he's actually like saying to... Um, Team Black, you think that, you know, I'm here bemoaning the fact that I've lost an eye. Actually, I would do it all again. <laughs> it's it's having lost an eye is not that I've gained Vega and that is worth it. So that is him at the time just trying to say you didn't you didn't win here at all. This was all me winning. Um, then later on with Lucerus and he's taunting him, saying you need to cut out your eye. That is him. He's just being a bully. He is. I mean, it's. he's probably come to terms with having lost an eye. He may well still have a chip on his shoulder about it, but um, he's just using it as an excuse to bully this smaller child. So um, is it cognitive dissonance? Perhaps a bit, but mostly I think it's just he comes across as a bully uh, 
and just trying to show himself as being the um the big man in town on both occasions um whether or not he succeeds i think that's for, for us to judge um, roughly halfway through uh, the stream, I will do what I always do, which is to say, uh, moderators, thank you so much. Um, if you are watching this live, then uh, and if you're enjoying the chat, then uh, I'll please just show a little bit of love to the moderators. They do an absolutely fantastic job. Um, uh, secondly, patrons, thank you. I, I can't do what I do uh, without you, so I hugely appreciate uh, your support as well. If you would like to support this channel, the best way to do that is through Patreon. There is a link down in the description. Let's go to a question from uh, Creative Branches saying, hey -o, Roberto. Let's not make that one stick. Uh, I'm reading Duncan Egg, and I'm uh, loving the simplistic, repetitive touchstones and story beats. Dunk's foot, Egg's floppy hat and boot, Dunk getting absolutely pummeled near to death, uh, Miss Too Tall. It reminds me of Harry Potter and its systemic story structure, or systematic story structure, where we get each touchstone mentioned in every instalment. What do you think are the most important touchstones for the tragedy at Summer Hall foreshadowing? Well, this is a really interesting question. So this is Dunk and Egg, which is one of the projects which is potentially being developed into a TV show. This is the story of Aegon V and Sir Duncan the Tall. And we've just had the first three instalments of what, maybe 12, something like that. And it goes all the way up to their deaths at Summerhall, at the tragedy at Summerhall. Is George R. R. Martin writing it with that in mind? Absolutely. So these beats are definitely, uh, and the kind of the, the repetitions of things, definitely uh, leading up to that. The, the key one um, is the his foot, um, Dunk's foot, and the, the idea that this was, it cost a prince his life. The, the story of the first, the Hedge Knight, the first of the Duncan Egg stories, is broadly that Dunk, um, when rushing to protect the, the fair maiden, he kicks a prince of the realm, and the law of the land is that he should lose his foot. But this gets escalated, um, and another prince of the, the realm, Baylor Breakspear, comes on his side. We have a, a seven trial by seven, seven versus seven combat, and the prince dies. Uh, but Dunk is vindicated by it. So he's there pondering at the end of the story his foot, because a prince died to save his foot. That's ultimately what happened. And he's there going, how, how is this? I mean, what's my fate? Is, is this going to lead to somewhere? Is this for, how is this forever going to repay that debt? And so I think that it keeps on getting referenced. It will lead all the way through to the tragedy at some hall. I don't know yet if I had to speculate, then um, the only thing we know about what happens there at the tragedy at Summer Hall is that this line that George R. R. Martin's got that says something like, if it weren't for the heroic actions of Sir Duncan the Tall, then bad things would have happened. Probably um, Rhaegar would not have been born. I wonder whether that was him sticking his foot in a door and saving um, the, the unborn child. And that then shows how that foot is useful all that time, how it saves the life of a prince. A prince was sacrificed for it. He then uses it to save the life of a prince in the end. It also, given the fact that there's um, speculation that perhaps one of his descendants is Hodor, the idea that he is holding the door does um, does add another layer in there. And I do wonder whether part of that, another thing, again, this is pure tinfoil speculation, something that he says again and again and again, dunk the lunk thicker than a castle wall. And I do wonder whether he does, he holds up 
a bit of summer hall in some way he he uses his foot to to stop a door from shutting he holds up some he allows people to escape something along those lines and he does end up being like a castle wall so that those are i think the the big beats we've got going on there um we've got dragon eggs hatching as another thing uh, which comes up we know that he's got egg has got Aegon has got a dragon egg himself. We get a prophecy in the Mystery Night. We get a prophecy that we get a dragon egg itself, and we get a prophecy about a dragon egg hatching. And so I think that this is going to start coming to the point where Egg is wanting to hatch dragon eggs. Um, got a question in the chat from... Ubermelon saying, is there a plot point or mystery that George R. Martin will know the conclusion of that we, the reader, will never know? Um, if so, what is most likely? Um, a, a mystery that he knows the conclusion of that we, the reader, will never know. Well, there are, there are some that are possible. So... Um, As a, as a random example, the letter that went to Aegon the Conqueror um, from Prince Nymor of Dawn that led to Aegon um, announcing an end to the war. Are we ever going to find out what was in there? I imagine if they do, if they do a House of the Dragon about Aegon's conquest, then yes, we will. But in the book universe, in book canon. No, I don't think we ever will. So that's one of those things where he he probably knows, um, but he's not going to say. There are other things like who wrote the pink letter. It's entirely possible that we won't ever find out a full confirmation of that. Um, what is going to happen a lot more, I think, is that we're going to have some mysteries that are, are not ever fully and officially solved but the clever characters think they know what happened. And uh, that is things like who hired the cat's paw assassin to try and kill Bran. We've never had a full and official confirmation of who it is, but Tyrion and Jamie between them think they know who it is now. So we won't have a full confirmation, but we now probably know. So that's more George R. R. Martin style rather than just keeping mysteries to himself. And there, there may well be some, if when he gets to the end of the whole uh, story, um, perhaps he will start answering a few questions about these things. But I don't think he's going to be answering questions um, between uh, sort of on these kinds of mysteries before he's finished A Dream of Spring. Um, Let's go to a question from Nenyan, uh, saying, Over the last week, I've got into a discussion with someone on Facebook about Daemon, Daemon Targaryen. They seem to believe that Daemon is a Valyrian supremacist, so much so that he apparently loathes Rhaenyra's older, ch older sons, and it is the reason he cannot get it up, so to speak, for non-Valyrian women. When I asked them to explain nettles... They stopped responding and deleted their earlier posts. While I would not be surprised if Damon were to mention somewhere that he believes Targaryens are better than others, I do not think that he is that extreme. Uh, the simple fact that Rhaenyra's sons or dragon riders are, I think, proof enough for him that they are indeed Targaryens. What are your thoughts? Um, so he does very clearly believe, certainly in the show and I see no reason why this is different in the books, probably even more so in the books. He does believe in uh, Targaryen exceptionalism. This is a doctrine that uh, Jaehaerys, the old king, came up with, which was um, basically saying Targaryens are different to normal humans um, and closer to gods than men. And as a result, we don't have to follow the same rules as you. So we get to uh, marry our own family. We get to um, have as many um, uh, husbands, wives, lovers as we want, and that's okay. 
And Jaehaerys, who was often held up as being this great, wonderful king, he came up with this Targaryen exceptionalism uh, idea and got it announced out to the entire Seven Kingdoms and basically said, this is, this is what it is. Targaryens are different to you and it's not subject to the same laws and rules as you are. Damon clearly believes that. You have that in that episode when he goes with Rhaenyra down into Flea Bottom, then he is coming out with this kind of line. You can do what you're a Targaryen. You can do whatever you want. You can marry and then you can have lovers on the side and that's okay. You can do that. He clearly has this view and he feel, he believes that he can do whatever he wants. So he does, um, I mean, I don't know whether supremacist is quite the right uh, word for it, but uh, Targaryen exceptionalism definitely is where he stands on this. I don't think, though, that would extend to um, disliking Rhaenyra's children. As you say, they are dragon riders, and they are certainly on the show. They are being brought up as Targaryens. They are learning old Valyrian. They are learning the histories of the Targaryens. Um, they are doing what they should. And they are also being quite Targaryen-y in volunteering to go and fly their dragons off and do things uh they're not there saying well we just we should probably just uh, uh relax and let the adults get on with this they're saying no we we should do this let, let us do this so i i th think he is very much a believer in targaryens being better and different but maybe in exactly the, the, the way that you're describing there um Question from Matthew Hawkins, um, saying, well, it's not really a question, just saying, my life has come to a crossroads. House of the Dragon is finished, so has Rings of Power. Last night I finished the last audiobook for The Wheel of Time, which I love. That's always a, a massive moment, such a huge series. Uh, the good news is that George R. Martin is three quarters of the way through through writing the winds of winter um so yes and in case you missed it this was george R. martin has done media rounds over the last week uh, he's done a lot of different interviews uh tv shows he was on stephen colbert a few other places and he clearly decided beforehand he knew he would be asked about how the winds of winter is coming along and he clearly came out with this uh line which he want to just keep and stick to which was that he's now 75 percent of the way through it now my best understanding that this is not he's uh started at the beginning and he's now 75 percent of the way through to the end i think he's meaning he's 75 percent of the way through the writing process his writing process is uh, quite iterative um and he will then go back so he will finish off a whole load of chapters and then he'll go back and think, oh, well, what I've just written here impacts on what I wrote there in that earlier chapter. I better go back and tweak that earlier chapter. So he will be constantly tweaking and nuancing and changing stuff that he's done earlier. And even once he's finished it all, he will then go through and trim some things, maybe take a couple of chapters out, reorder stuff, uh, maybe rewrite some. Uh, he's basically confirmed that at least one of the pre-release chapters that we've had uh, he's rewritten so it's it's quite a an ongoing and detailed process but he now he said he's there are a couple of characters that he has finished their story arcs for i think we can be reasonably certain one of them is Tyrion, which means that probably he must be near with Daenerys as well because Tyrion's going to be with Daenerys for a lot of this story probably and um he's uh so it's positive is what I'm saying if you're wanting to do the maths then the answer is 2026 but I would highly recommend not trying to do the maths uh is that I don't think it will work like that I think this is basically confirmation it's definitely not happening this year almost certainly not happening next year let's try and pick up on again in a couple of years time um so carl kostnark saying three quarters of a 1500 page book is almost 1200 pages which is a huge book unto itself well in terms of the um uh, the page count my best understanding is that he is 
he's now saying that it's currently about the size of the other big books he's, that he's got, the biggest books they've got so far, which is about 1,500 pages. So um, it could get as much as 2,000 pages. I, my best guess is probably end up about 1800 now i think i did that video whenever it was two three years ago how big will the winds of winter be i think there i guessed at 1600 pages and i said that was probably quite a conservative with a small c um estimate probably going to be bigger i think it will be bigger i think yeah 1800 pages plus appendices let's not forget uh generally he has like 100 pages worth of appendices this is almost certainly going to be broken down into at least two volumes and i think the publishers will be delighted with that i really do they've been waiting so long for this they know this is going to be a publishing event uh, of the decade and if they get to publish two books rather than one if they can have effectively four big pushes they could do they could publish book one in hardback then paperback softback and then they could do book two in hardback then paperback or softback they could stagger it out or if they want to they could just put it all up at the same time that they, they will make a lot more money um that way so i i think that yeah it'll be in two volumes maybe even three andrew k saying i think game of thrones and other external factors affected him and he could have had Common struggles uh, that authors deal with um, seems uh, much better of late for George R. R. Martin. Yeah, uh, so um, it, it's very clear that he is. This isn't. A, he'd been writing at the same speed for the last eleven years. It has been in stops and starts. When Game of Thrones was on, he definitely felt the pressure to finish this, and he now doesn't. He feels a lot freer. He definitely had a very productive period of time. During the first year of COVID lockdown, he seems to have locked himself away in his mountain hideaway and got quite a lot of writing done. The last year or so, he's had a lot more on his plate in terms of um, just planning meetings to do with the different spin-offs and things like that. He's not writing for any of them, but he has inputs into all of them and has an interest in all of them. So, yeah, I, it's not been plain sailing all the way through i don't think uh carl carlsnack saying george R. martin was joking about the publisher splitting it into two volumes but he didn't seem too keen on it but it's hard to carry around a novel the size of a dictionary yeah i mean i he, he won't want it but i think that there's um there's no real real way around it it's um if, if it's going to be anywhere approaching two thousand pages i I can't see how you could have that in one volume. It would, and I think the publishers would want to have it in two volumes. So, um, what he probably doesn't want is for it to be split up again in the way that um, leaves a big gap, leaves you wondering what's going on in other parts of the story. He doesn't want to split it out in the same way he he has done previously, where you get one book which is um, uh, these characters another book which is these characters i think he just wants now to tell the story so i think it's not going to be two separate but he will still brand it all i suspect as the winds of winter but it'll be the winds of winter part one and the winds of winter part two um robin isamar saying in the past you've made videos about various economies of middle earth which even i who wasn't really a lord of the rings fan have enjoyed well i'm very Glad to hear that. Have you thought about making similar videos about the world of A Song of Ice and Fire? For example, different currencies, trading relations, and of course the tax policies of different kings. I, I have. I did in fact do uh, Joffrey's tax policy. This was a... I mean, if you've not come across these videos that I've done, I find these rather fun. I, I really enjoy making them. Um, and it started out with what was Aragorn's tax policy, but this was a, a slightly jokey comment from George R. R. Martin once when he was asked about Tolkien. And George R. Martin is a massive Tolkien fan. He's not throwing any shade on Tolkien at all, but what he was saying was that one of the things he wanted to critique was this idea that in Tolkien's worldview, if the king was good, then the land would prosper. And uh, he was more of a mindset of okay that's fair enough and you can say that 
Aragorn was a good king, therefore the, it prospered. But I want more detail. I want to know what was Aragorn's tax policy. And I thought that's a great question for a video. So I did a video on what Aragorn's tax policy was. Um, and then I followed that up with the, the economics of the elves and the dwarves and various other places. And I have done one on Joffrey's tax policy as well, just to sort of balance it up. I will do one at some point, probably in the new year. It's on my long list. I have a very, very long list of videos that I want to make. It's on my long list. Um, I will do the economics of the Dance of the Dragons because economics plays a huge part. Money plays a huge role in the Dance of the Dragons. So um, I think it's definitely worth a video. And, and I will do that. And maybe, maybe a few more. I don't know. People do seem to quite like them. Um, the King's Road saying, G'day, Robert. Uh, G'day to you. Uh, was Joffrey wise to have Ned beheaded? If Ned had been sent to the wall, he could have just returned to Winterfell. The Northmen would not think Ned was abandoning the wall, as he'd explained Joffrey's illegitimacy and the situation. In that case, Ned could either march down south as Rob did, um, but as an experienced battle commander rather than as a boy, things would not have gone the same way, or could have just pulled up stumps and held the north against the attackers. So, yeah, this was the plan. This was the plan that they put together, uh, that Varys basically put together, Cersei agreed to, which was that Ned was going to be sent to the wall, become a member of the Night's Watch. That's why Yoren was hanging around, he'd been told basically, you stay here and uh, you can take Ned Stark back up north with you. And that um, was the deal that effectively that Ned struck, was that he would admit his guilt, he would admit that he was a traitor, uh, he would say that Joffrey was the rightful king, and in return his his life would be spared, but more importantly for Ned, Sansa's life would also be spared. So that was the plan. But then Joffrey did as Joffrey did and chopped off Ned's head. Um, I have a feeling that this was Littlefinger um, just sort of whispering in his ear, suggesting these kinds of things, prompting it because he did not, he would not want uh, Ned heading back up north because then Ned knew exactly what um, Littlefinger had been doing, how he betrayed Ned. Um, and he Ned would obviously have told Cat, and Cat would have therefore hated Littlefinger with a passion, and Littlefinger would not have wanted that. So, but was this a good thing, tactically a good thing? The best thing was for that never to, none of that have, to have been an option, just for him to have kept a prisoner. Now, that was what Tywin wanted. You get the episode, the last um, Tyrion episode of book one, he's there with Tywin, and Tywin ends up saying, okay, Tyrion, you need to go down and take control of what's happening in King's Landing. And the reason why is because of all of what he sees as the tactical errors that have been made by Joffrey and by Cersei. And one of them is allowing Sir Barristan to, uh, or sacking Sir Barristan and letting him to, to go free. Another one was for Ned to be beheaded. I think he would have said the same about Ned going to the wall, to be honest, because Ned was... Uh, um, first of all, the moment the Ned was killed, war was inevitable um, because the Starks would just, they would not forgive. Um, the, the moment you kill Ned Stark, they were going to be angry. So that pushed them towards the war. That made any kind of a ceasefire seem really quite hard. Um, and uh, also it robbed them of their greatest um, bargaining chip. Because if it did come down to some kind of, and all of these things eventually do have to come down to some kind of um, agreement as to where you go afterwards, um, how do you end this war? If they had Ned as well as Sansa, they could bargain to get Jamie back. And Tywin was obsessed with get, getting Jamie back. 
So um, that's the the main point is this should never have happened. It, Ned should not have been put there and in front of the people with this possibility of being either killed or sent to the wall. But out of the two options, which one tactically was best for the Lannisters? I, I mean, I have a feeling that if Ned had headed up north with the um, with Yoren, he wouldn't have made it to Winterfell. <laughs> Tywin would never have allowed that. If he discovered that um, Ned was there on his way, he would have recaptured him. Um, he would because Harren Hall was just off of the main road, main on the, the King's Road heading north. So um, I, I don't think that that would actually have made much difference. Let's have a quick flick uh, through the chat. Um, see McBroom saying if Ned had sworn an oath to go to the wall, he would have honoured it. Yeah, I think that's probably true, but that but he would have given them all the information that they he would have stopped off at Winterfell and told them what to do, and they would have definitely uh, respected that. Um, uh, Rhaegar, um, Mark Sheese is saying Rhaegar also defeated Barristan, yet in a in a tourney, and tourney fighting is very different to real fighting. There was also a very clear rumour that um, sometimes Rhaegar was allowed to win because he was the heir to the throne. So um, I don't think we can take that as necessarily that Rhaegar was a better fighter than Barristan. Uh, Nerd of the Rings is in the chat. Hey there, Matt. Great to see you. Um, saying, hey, Robert, what's the biggest thing you want to see improved for season two of Rings of Power? Uh, always really excellent questions, Matt. Thank you. Um, I, I mean, I think it's what I've said actually a little bit earlier before you were here. Um, it's the structure. I, I think the, the the structure, everything flows from the structure. If you have, if you tell the story in the way that Tolkien told the story, then it's going to start feeling better. And the decisions which flow from that um, are just a lot easier because you don't have to change things. The, a lot of the changes which happened in season one and to Tolkien's legendarium were in order to fit in with the structure. For example, um, the moment you create this mystery box and you take Sauron's identity as the mystery, you then take the antagonist out of this story. Now, they created a new antagonist in Adar down in the Southlands, and I thought that worked really well. But then if you've got um, Galadriel, who was trying to hunt for Sauron, she, she will keep on looking for Sauron unless somebody opposes her. And who could she possibly listen to? Who would she possibly respect? The only person really was the High King, Gil-galad. That means that you have to change Gil-galad's character from a character who was the first to recognise the growing shadow in the southeast um, of Middle Earth in the books to a character who um, is actually opposing the hunt for Sauron. So. Um, that's the kind of changes which have to happen because you have to create an antagonist uh, in the story. Um, similarly, the Harfords, they had to have some, um, uh, not, if not an antagonist, then they had to have some problems to solve, some things to get past. How on earth do you get this uh, community who hates outsiders to to accept having the stranger with them. Well, he has to help them out in some way. How how can he possibly help them out? And then you get this whole, well, they'll leave people behind unless, uh, you know, if you break an ankle or if you're sick or something like that, then they'll leave you behind on the migration. Uh, but the stranger can come and help. You're then creating these problems, and those are the kinds of issues that didn't feel right for a lot of people. So. I would just say season two, let's get the structure right. We've got Sarah on there. We can try and um, pick up as few as many of the pieces as we are that are in slightly the wrong places, get them sorted out as quickly as possible, and then just tell the story that Tolkien wrote. 
um, in the order that he wrote um, with the characters that he wrote. And that, that's, that would be the, the change and it all stems from the structure. Uh, but yeah, interesting uh, question. Thanks, Matt. I would love to know your, um, uh, your thoughts as well. Um, and yeah, you're saying uh, felt like a lot of things stemmed from the mystery box approach. Yeah, indeed. Uh, I mean, we we have had a little bit of a chat uh, about that ourselves, so I think we we share that view. Um, just having a flick through the chat, um, uh, we've got a question from Rob petrie do you think any of david gemmell's novels will be made into film or tv um so i read them when i was a teenager i think uh the belgariad and um i forgot what the other one was that he did but um yeah they were they were good um i really enjoyed them i think that they uh, although possibly if I were a studio exec, I would say that they have that same kind of feel that, uh, say, The Wheel of Time has, um, that post-Tolkien. And if you read David Gemmell, then you will... Um, uh, in fact, I'm getting David Gemmell and David Eddings mixed up. David Gemmell, I am. Apologies. David Gemmell was Drust the Legend. Uh, and that was a great book. I, I, Legend is, is a fantastic story. So uh, might they be picked up? I would like that to be picked up if you're going to pick up anyone. Uh, Druss was a, a great character. A lot of fantasy has this young, obviously young um, protagonist who's going out and saving the world. Druss, as a protagonist, is introduced to us as an old man. He's he's done it all, and this is now he's being brought back out of retirement for one last hurrah. So I would love that. Um, I have not heard any rumours that that they've ever nobody has bought the rights to make them. Um, Blair asking about my thoughts on the, uh, Henry Cavill. Yeah, I did talk about that quite extensively earlier in the stream, so I won't sort of reiterate that now. Um, uh, Reflection for having saying still waiting on that recommended reading list. Uh, yeah, I will come up with a recommended reading list. Maybe, maybe over. Um, I'm going to take. I'll announce this probably later. But I, I'm going to take a, a week or so off just to to get my breath back after covering two shows. So I'm hoping to get a bit of time to actually get and do some reading. I've not had a much chance to do much reading recently. So um, if I um, uh, and one of which is the three bodies uh, problem, which is something I'm I've been meaning to read for a very long time. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, uh, Rob Chudley or saying who should narrate the Winds of Winter and the Dream String audio books? Um, Harry Lloyd is my uh, pick. He did the Duncan Egg audio narrations and was outstandingly good. Uh, the The thing about The Winds of Winter and all of the A Song of Ice and Fire is that they have so many characters. It's literally it's a Guinness World Record for the most amount of characters in an audiobook. Um, and so you need an actual actor. You need a proper actor who can do different voices um, uh, to different characters. And, and each chapter is from a different person's perspective and that also has to be read in a slightly different way i think harry lloyd would do an excellent job i'm up completely in his camp um Do, 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 just having a quick flick through. Simon Vance is a fantastic narrator. I agree. For Simon Vance is indeed uh, an excellent narrator too. Uh, Andrew K asking if I've read any Patrick Rothfuss. Um, I recently bought The Name of the Wind. I hope to get to it soon. Yes, yeah, so I've read. He's he's written two in that series, and the break that he's got after those is supposed to be a tri trilogy. Um, I, I he's been not writing or has not finished uh, book three for longer than George R. R. Martin has not finished book six in A Song of Ice and Fire. So they are excellent. But if if you're still smarting from the lack of George R. R. Martin finishing his series, then perhaps wait until Patrick Rothfuss finishes his. He's, he's written very in interestingly. He has written very um, eloquently about writer's block, um, which is a real thing. It's it's something that, particularly when you write something that lots of people buy into and care about, 
and if for whatever reason you just can't you can't get the words out that's um it's a it's a real issue and so i i'm never one of these people who like will get on the writer's back and say you have to finish this now uh, i completely understand that but uh, yeah they are excellent books and very well written um james horner saying i have two questions um, firstly, do you think that it is possible that King Baylor, Baylor the Blessed, had some sort of vision or dream about the Blackfire Rebellion, and that is why he locked his sisters up? If he hadn't locked his sister up, mine at all. Um, it seems very like George R. Martin to have a Baylor help cause the thing he was trying to stop. Um, I should have said, by the way, and um, none of the rings has probably gone away now, but um, do go and check out his channel excellent channel uh if you, i'm sure if you're a talking fan you've already discovered it but um uh nose of the rings is fantastic anyway uh <coughs> pardon me uh baylor baylor is a character a king who comes he's a couple of generations three generations after what we have going on in the dance of the dragons he is a pious king he is the king who fully embraces the faith of the seven this is not something the targaryens did targaryens thought themselves different they had their own gods um and they weren't really yes they they supported the state religion that is the faith of the seven but they didn't really seem to believe it baylor seems to have really believed it he seems to have been obsessive about it and he seems to have been what we read about him is <clears throat> a whole series of so obviously over the top pious things that he does that you just go this guy seems he seems a little bit beyond just like being a fan of this religion he's he's walking barefoot to dawn um uh, because he wishes to to show quite how sad he is about what he is He's a character who does a whole load of book burnings, books that he thinks are heretical. There is nothing in this that makes me think that he is very Targaryen-y and trying, therefore, to um, make the Targaryen um, dream come true. So that I don't think so. Now, one of the things that he did do was he uh, he did marry his uh, sister in a very Targaryen-y way, but never consummated it because he didn't think that was appropriate. Um, and then he locked her and two other sisters up uh, in the Red Keep. It became known as the Maiden Vault. He just locked them up in there and didn't let them come out because he didn't, he, he wanted them to remain pure and things like this. So one of them uh, did escape. So his wife did escape and uh, a few times actually. And so um, the, the, while she was out, she seems to have had an affair with Aegon, who will soon or later become Aegon IV, and she had a ch child who will become Dame, Damon Blackfire, and that is where the Blackfire rebellions come from. Do I think that Baylor had some vision and he was trying to stop it? Yes, it's a very George R. R. Martin kind of thing that in order to try and prevent a prophecy from coming true you um actually make it happen that's a very george r martin thing but baylor just seems so focused in on the faith of the seven that i don't think that he's that it's it, him trying to do targaryen things doesn't seem to fit at all um so yeah that's my general take if they do that would be fascinating to um uh uh, if they ever cover that in something like House of the Dragon, whether they do make him quite that pious. Um, so uh, we'll see. Uh, you also asked James Horner about uh, what I thought of David Tennant and Russell T. Davis returning to Doctor Who. Um, so, yeah, we're moving around quite a lot on this. But if you missed the news, um, Doctor Who, they had their regeneration. The 13th Doctor, Jodie Whitt Whittaker, has regenerated. And... This is this happens all the time in Doctor Who. A new Doctor comes along, um, and sometimes they change the showrunner. And 
the original showrunner from New Who, from when it was rebooted, whenever it was, um, Russell T. Davis has come back. And he has come back, and the official announcement is we are going to have three, I think it is, David Tennant as the Doctor episodes. Jodie Whitt Whittaker, the 13th Doctor, regenerated into David Tennant. And we had a wonderful the regeneration scenes are always fun. Um, you know what David Tennant's like. He just suddenly appears and he's there going, I know these teeth. What? What? It's it's a very David Tennant, quite fun. And I think it'll be great. It was just a short run, three episodes, back to the glory times of David Tennant. And we've got Donna Nobles coming back as well. Uh, it should should be great. Um We've got um, Shuti Gatwa, who's going to be the next Doctor who will be appearing, I think, in a Christmas special next year. Um, so I'm excited. I think Russell T. Davis has got big plans. I thought he was an excellent showrunner. Um, obviously love David Tennant, so I'm, I'm a happy Robert at the moment. Martin S. In the early few episodes of House of the Dragon, I perceived Otto Hightower as fairly decent compared to Damon, anyway. That has changed. He is not very likable now. Still not as bad as several of the Game of Thrones uh, villains. Yeah, so he he's definitely quite manipulative. Um, you... I think the first time that we really saw him being a baddie Otto was when he's there sort of saying to Alison, you go and, you go and comfort the king. And it's clearly like he's pimping out his daughter here. That's the that's the feel that we've got there, and it's kind of been a slippery slope. I think Lisa fans, incidentally, he doesn't he's not been getting the same praise as people like Paddy Considine, but I think he's done a really fantastic job to make Otto very low key. And for an actor like Lisa fans, who I mean, I've seen him live on a stage. He's got a huge amount of personal charisma. Um, and to to bring that down to um, a, a character to make Otto really understated, uh, I thought he did a fantastic job with that. Um, but he is he's a character we hate because of the things that we know that he has been doing even if we're not seeing him do those things. We probably hate him in a way more than someone like Larry Strong, who we see doing horrific things. Uh, but it's because we just know in the background he's been doing them. Um, but yeah, I don't think many book readers liked Otto to start with, but this is just added to that. Um, Andrew Kay saying, arguably uh, Baylor could have tried to end the line of the Conqueror with a celibacy and locking away women with... Um, uh, possibly prophecy related. Yeah, may maybe he was just trying to end it all. It's it's entirely possible. This is the way that we um, um, historically have interpreted Baylor was that he's he's the person who tried to end all of that Targaryen prophecy nonsense. JD Finity. Do you think Torrhen Stark was influenced to kneel to Aegon by the Children of the Forest and their magic in any way? Uh, first live, by the way. Love the content. Well, thank you very much, and welcome. Um, if, if you're in the chat, uh, <laughs> do join in. Say hi to people. Um, it's, a, it's a lovely chat there. Um, so Torrhen Stark was the King of the North, um, King of Winter, when the Targaryens invaded. And he mustered his army, headed south, and then met Aegon and bent the knee. Now, the the standard interpretation of this by uh, Song of Ice and Fire fans has been, actually, that just makes sense. Uh, that it's just, if you look, he'd just seen what had happened with Harrenhal, the field of fire. Um, dragons can mean you can hear what a dragon's like, but then seeing Balerion, the Black Dread, in the flesh, and the other two dragons... He, he knew he was going to be defeated. So actually, he just took the only sensible option. That is the... And I think that's still the Occam's Razor position. This TV show has added in the possibility. Joe Magician, among others, has started to speculate that perhaps Aegon, if he's got this prophecy of terrible things coming from the North, and he suddenly meets this person who's there 
and is basically defending the realms against the north, uh, what happens north of the wall. Um, will he tell him about the prophecy? Will they have a discussion and go, well, I think that we, you know, Aegon will say, well, I've got this prophecy which I need to be dealing with um, here. And Torrance Starks, yes, but our role is also to protect the, the North. And then Aegon says, well, I'll, I'll allow you to stay. And if uh, if you just stop being king, because I want to be king. And then they came to an agreement. That is possible. It does kind of make sense of one of the, the oddments in Aegon's life, which is that if he did invade for the reason that he had this prophecy of a great threat coming from the north, why didn't he ever go to the wall? Why did it take him three decades to get as far as Winterfell? He had to trust the Starks in some way. Um, was he influenced by the children? Was Torrance Stark influenced by the children of the forest and their magic? I mean, Possibly the Weirwood Network by this point, if we're taking show canon, the Weirwood Network by this point know all of what's going on. And they probably, yes, if they had some sort of influence on him, then quite possibly. Uh, but I don't think, again, Occam's Razor says that there doesn't need to be a mystery here. It's actually just the sensible option. Uh, Kofi Amanqua saying, any changes to your Who Killed Septon Moon theory? Um, I talked about Septon Moon actually quite a bit earlier on in the the stream, so I won't repeat that one, but the short answer is no. Um, because uh, Bay saying, agreed, Risa fans is amazing in this. Um, the actually, for those who don't know Risa fans, if you ever saw Notting Hill. Uh, the the movie he's the the mad friend Hugh Grant's mad friend uh, so that's the kind of energy that he brings to a lot of stuff and he's completely um, dialed it down for this role um, question from Amy Smith do you think the Maester conspiracy will ever be exposed outwardly with consequence or will they get through without blame? Um, exposed to the world? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I don't think how you would expose it, I think, is the, the big thing here. Because it's not um, it, it's not all maesters. It can't be all maesters. Uh, but it could just be the, the ruling conclave. And some people have already come out and said it. Um, is that exposing it to the world? Maester Marwyn, for example, not really, but I can't see how it would advance the plot, and I can't see how it would likely come out. It, I think Sam's got a lot on his plate already without having to sort of start investing a Maester plot line, and he is the only person who is going to be down in Old Town during A Song of Ice and Fire in a way that will allow us to dig through that. So I think I think the answer is no. Um, and I think that George R. R. Martin probably likes this as something that, even on the show in House of the Dragon, it's hinted at a few times. Um, certainly the fact that people think it's possible is, is referenced. But it's never to the fore. It's never explicitly said, and I think that George R. R. Martin likes that. Um, Jibber Doll saying, hi Robert, what is your favourite moment in A Song of Ice and Fire? This was actually, this was a super chat you did last time on Sunday. I did answer that bit already. Uh, so uh, thank you for the uh, the other um, um, this super chat. Um I'll give the short version of what it is, but do scroll back to somewhere near the beginning of this live stream. I answered it up there. Um, the short version is that moment when um, at the end of that two chapters on the King's Road, when Lady has been effectively sentenced to death, and it's a tragedy, a, a two-act uh, tragedy that we have, at, which is inevitable given all of the characters that are there. And then Ned takes it on himself, this role of being the executioner, and just spends a moment with Lady. That, for me, is a, 
such a powerful moment because it tells us about all the different characters we've got going on there. Philip saying, hey, Robert, any clue what Corliss and Adam talked about after the Battle of the Gullet, uh, the Isle of Faces? Um, I mean, I don't think that um, uh, Corliss has got a clear link across to the um, the Children of the Forest. So the Adam Vallon is fascinating because there's no we're never told why he went to the Isle of Faces. He, he just went there. Um, it seems to imply that maybe he's uh, he's on some kind of a mission. It wouldn't, can't be just he's in the middle of a civil war. It's not just that I'm, I'm intrigued. I wonder what there is at the, at the Isle of Faces. I've always wondered, and now I have a dragon. I think I'll go and find out. That, that doesn't seem to be what his character was about, and that doesn't seem right. So he does seem to be on some sort of mission perhaps so um could this have come from Corliss in some way Corliss is not really associated with the weirwood network in any way he's out at sea a lot of the time um and we don't hear of there being a, a weirwood tree on driftmark so it's it's a mystery the the kind of the conversation that implication i think is that this is a recognition of who uh, Adam and Alan are. And on the show, it will be fascinating because obviously um, this is uh, Sea Smoke, the Rider of Sea Smoke. So how does that work? This is Lenore's dragon. How is that going to work? Um, I mean, the only, when I'm saying the Corliss has no connection with the Weirwood Network, the only thing I would say is that Corliss is, he's traveled a lot around the world and he has seen things that others have not seen. So whereas on mainland Westeros, people probably just dismiss the um, the Weirwood network as, I mean, they even think about the, the Weirwood as a Weirwood network about the, the old gods and things like that. I think that he probably would have a slightly more open-minded approach to it because he's seen so many things um, around the world. Uh, Ellen McLeod saying, you're one of my favorite Game of Thrones YouTubers. Thank you very much indeed. Um, Let's go to um, Mark Sheets is saying, are there any bonsai weirwood trees? Not that I'm aware of. Um, let's go to a question from Lauren Mintz uh, saying, hello, Robert. My question is about your feelings towards changes made in House of the Dragon from Fire and Blood. Is there a change in the show that you think was better than what George R. Martin wrote in text? What change did you like the best and which one did you not like the most? Um, personally, I like how the show emphasised that Alicent was forced into a more power-hungry role by her father, not that she was a twisted person from the beginning like Cersei. My least favourite was Rhaenys having the Greens at her mercy, not ending the war before it started by killing the handful of people who'd imprisoned her. Um, the expla explanation that it wasn't her war to start uh, sounds less like logical reasoning and more like a cop out. Well, I'll I'll answer your, your question in just one second. I, I do want to pick up on this Rainey's point because a lot of people have um, questioned this. Now, I think the fact that a lot of people have questioned this showed that it's it was not explained. At the very least, this was not explained particularly well in the show. Um, I do quite, I understand this, this is not my war to start, but I think that the bigger point here, for me at least, is that we look at this backwards saying there was going to be a big war, she could have stopped it. The, the, her character at that time had just had a conversation with Alicent, who had basically said, I'm going to try and stop there being a war. Um, and so Rhaenys probably um, will have been there on the dragon and who she, who she saw at the front was not actually Aegon, it was Alicent. Alicent was the person who was staring her down. And I think 
this wasn't necessarily where the showrunners or explained it but for me that's the explanation that makes the most sense is that yes i think this wasn't her war but to start is a, a valid point the fact that um uh, she was still only acting head of house valarion her husband was not dead um so was it really for her to do that all of these kinds of things i think are valid but i think it's the fact that she doesn't seem to want war she doesn't actively seem to war like wanting to go to war over things that doesn't seem to be her character and she's just had this conversation with alicent who doesn't want war and so she's going to try and stop there being a war and so rainis is perhaps honoring that and is perhaps going okay well i will actually give peace a chance i i, I kind of respect that um so i i understand a lot of people didn't quite buy that logic but i think that tells us a lot about her as a character i think if she had come up and then just immediately burned everybody on stage we would be going away going oh wow Rainice, she's pretty bloodthirsty. There's no taking no prisoners. Um, that that's that would have shown us a very different part of a character. This showed us uh, a merciful and peace loving part of a character, which I think is quite good. Um, but you're asking about the the change I liked the most and the change I liked the least. Um, I think I'm with George R. Martin in terms of what I like the most, which is the expansion of the character of Viserys so that he his character i mean i wouldn't say it was two-dimensional in the book but he's never the focus in the book he's he's just there as being this kind of weak king who is just like trying to stop people fighting and that's it but here through a number of avenues he actually starts to gain some agency. Now, one of them is the fact that he has this prophecy that he's trying to pass down. One of them, we really saw the, the loyalty he had to Rhaenyra and the love he had for Rhaenyra, which was there all, all the way through. And um, another, and this is how Paddy Considine um, talked about the central key to his character was that he never forgave himself pardon me he never forgave himself for the manner of his wife's death he loved his wife and he was so obsessed with getting a son that uh, he made the decision for her that this this child should be born and his wife should be killed and obviously then the child dies anyway and paddy considine says that for him was the moment that he realized that he then never forgave himself for what happened there and that is why towards the at the end with his like his last words and it's like my love and that's it he's going back to meet his love his his wife and so all of this was just an extended stay where he was trying to do the right thing but he just part of him had died at that point which creates a greater character and I've waxed lyrical about Paddy Considine's um, performance before on here, so I won't do it again, but I thought he, he it was brilliant. The, the change I've disliked the least, it's, it's not so much uh, one change so as a, an accumulation of a number of changes, which is the, the way that the outbreak of war has turned from being a very clear intentional thing to being um the result of a series of misunderstandings um and lacks of control and things like that um the the fact that alicent believes that her son or, or that viserys named her son heir on his deathbed is not in the book i thought on its own merits that was a nice little twist and change uh, i liked it the fact that um in the battle of the fight over shipbreaker bay uh, lucerus lost control of arax and aemon lost control of uh, vega that's not in the book i thought on its own merits that was really good um 
but it means when you add those things together with a whole load of other smaller bits, you just get this almost passive slide into war, which I much preferred the way that the book was very clear that this was not a passive slide into war. Either side would happily have uh, um, uh, launched uh, a war. Uh, Flotfear13 saying, almost never catch you live. So when I do, I feel I could send you a little something to support your work. Well, thank you very much. And cheers to the mods and everyone picking up other people's questions from the chat. Uh, well, thank you. I hugely appreciate that and, and welcome. I'm glad you could make it this time. Um, question from Martin S. This is a Lord of the Rings question. How was Erendil's ship of Vingolotta made able to fly? Was it the power of Manwe? Also, do you think Manwe can cast lightning from his fingertips, Darth Sidious style, albeit with by other means, obviously? So, um, so this is Elrond's dad, and in uh, the so this is before the Rings of Power. Elrond and Elros, his twin brother's dad, this guy called Erendil, he went to Valinor and begged the case of. Um, the people of Middle-earth, they were being overrun. Morgoth was taking over. And basically, Erendil went off in his ship, Fingalotta, and uh, persuaded the Valar to come in and help, which they do, and that's the end of the First Age. So um, what then happens is that Erendil and Elwing, they they get taken up into the heavens. And he, Erendil, then he has a Silmaril on his forehead um, and he, his boat, his ship, uh, sails across the sky. And that is the, the, the morning and evening star, the, the star of Erendil, um, which is up there. Now, how is that, how does that happen? What magic is it that gets it up there? Yes, it's the magic of Manwe, but, I think the bigger important point is that the, those were the elder days. And this is the dividing line that Tolkien has written, uh, which creates a kind of a difference between the mythological and the simple fantasy. So the what happens in the, the mythological, the pre, the, the first age and earlier, that sounds like the kind of myths that we know about people turn into uh, birds um, ships fly up into the sky um the the gods are warring in the heavens this this kind of thing um there, there are great lamps upon the top of mountains uh, which gets spilled over by the the enemy this is these these are mythological type and Tolkien was clearly, he understood what he was doing, a great reader and understander of myth. Um, this is the dividing line. Elrond's father was the last of this great mythological type world. And Elrond and his brother, they were leading lights in the, the more um, grounded fantasy that we have going on in the second and third ages so so that's what it is yes it's magic but this is because it's more sort of mythological there is no written hard explanation and tolkien again i talked a little bit earlier about george r, r. martin's approach to uh, to magic george r. r martin very clearly wanted magic not to have a set of clear formulas he wanted there to be an element of mystery to it that's tolkien's approach as well tolkien did not have a hard and fast magical system what he, he saw magic as almost an extension of the world. And we, we get a wonderful time when Sam is there and uh, talks to um, Galadriel and Galadriel saying, yeah, well, I think, yes, I think you'd call this magic, but you know, it's, we, we don't use that word. This is just what we do. It's not. So the elves do things that other people might think are magical, but it's not, it's not, magic spell this is just what they do and can manway cast lightning from his fingertips darth Sidious style if he wishes to manway can do whatever he wants um okay so uh think i've got 
Uh, one last question from uh, my patrons. Uh, then I'm going to be trying to pick up as many questions in the chat. So now's a good time to be dropping questions into the chat. Catherine Firsith saying, if we can draw the line from House of the Dragon to the current timeline in the main series, what will the new information on Aegon's prophecy mean or tell us about current Targaryens? Have they forgotten the prophecy and their knowledge of this? In the same way that the North and the Starks have. What are your thoughts now on the characters like Maester Aemon and Rhaegar? Aemon is so old that he's close to the living memory of his house, going quite a long way back. What do you think he made of it all? Did he seek to find out more? Um, maybe he sought that knowledge at the Citadel his whole life. Um, okay, so how does this impact on the story we have? I think it is very clear, definitely, Danny does not know this prophecy. And... and this is one of the things that I'm most looking forward to over the next couple of years within the A Song of Ice and Fire fandom is we're trying to trace this prophecy down through the Targaryens and seeing how it may well have impacted on them, but also when it got lost, because Danny clearly doesn't have it. Now, that might mean that it was just it passed down to the Mad King and then he was killed before he could pass that on uh, to anyone. He told Rhaegar maybe, but Rhaegar obviously wouldn't have told Daenerys. Maybe that's where it ended. But Rhaegar doesn't ever give the impression of being someone who is there trying to fulfill, um, other than one moment, which I shall talk about just a second trying to fulfill that specific prophecy he he seems to be hunting down something and in the scrolls and then he discovers something and that's the point at which he goes on his kind of big prophecy quest he says uh i have been this is what barristan says that he arrived one day in the training yard and it says it appears i must be uh i must be a fighter i must be a warrior and that's the point at which he starts trying to believe that he is the prince that was promised. And then um, he thinks that his son is the prince that was promised. So he clearly has discovered this in some way, in some old writings. Now, I, my gut instinct, it's as in he was not told it by his father. So my gut instinct is that this was lost before then. And then... We know that Eamon was in contact. He was writing to Rhaegar. So I think that Eamon must have discovered a few things and put Rhaegar, pointed Rhaegar in the right direction. And then Rhaegar read some stuff which was linked in again to this prince that was promised pro uh, prophecy. The It was kind of rekindled a little bit earlier on by the Woods Witch, who was almost certainly sent by Blood Raven. So we get the Weirwood Network's interest in the Prince that was promised prophecy as well. Now, so my take is it didn't get down that far, but they were just discovering a few random odd things here and there. We know that um, uh, one of, uh, Eamon talks about a, a brother of his, this is Deer and the Drunkard, had visions, visions of, we think of dragons hatching, and that will have impacted on Egg. So it feels like Aemon started getting dragon dreams. Others had dragon dreams. He also had some dragon dreams, and he was doing some research, and he was discovering stuff, but the actual core message had not been passed down at that point. So where was it lost? Possibly with Baylor, who seems to have turned his back on a lot of the old Targaryen ways. Possibly even in the House of the Dragon time, in the Dance of the Dragons. That's the thing that we will find out, because um, it, what Viserys seems to have only told Rhaenyra at this point. Rhaenyra has discovered that he did not tell Daemon, she will presumably at some point tell her heir, Jacaris, but hashtag book spoilers, Jacaris isn't going to survive. She will then try and tell her next heir, he will not survive. Her next heir, he will not survive. And so finally, we get down to Aegon the second, who has never been told this prophecy. And then we'll get down to Aegon the third, who probably was not told this prophecy either. 
So that is a, a reasonable point at which it may well have been lost during the Dance of the Dragons. Uh, Green Star asking about thoughts on drastic different dragon designs. I love them. Yeah, I thought the, the dragon designs for the show were some of the best things that they did. I think the, the, having different types of dragons uh, worked really well. George Martin was very clear that he wanted um, to have um, the dragons look different. He wanted clear distinctions between the dragons. In, in Game of Thrones, with the best villain in the world, the three dragons they had um, looked very similar. And so it was often quite hard to tell them apart. But here, it's really important for the story of the House of the Dragon that the dragons are different and they have different strengths. And so we want to be able to see them. And I think we can. Um, Cars Bellarina saying, who killed Magor? And Lord of the Rings tinfoil stream someday. Um, a Lord of the Rings tinfoil stream someday is possible. Yeah, that would be, um, that'd be quite fun. Um, who killed Magor? I mean, it could. Uh, I don't know. My my, my guess, guess is a member of the King's God, um, but I think it actually doesn't matter who killed Magor. Um, what matters is the fact that at that point everyone wanted him dead, and um, once he'd lost the kingdom, once he'd lost those people around him, it, anyone could have done it. Um, and Anshuman Futada saying, Who's your favorite knight of the Kingsguard in Westerosi history and why? It probably said Duncan the Tall, just because he's great. Um, it, it's not, um, I mean, I, I imagine they're probably better fighters. Arthur Dane was probably a better fighter. Um, Sandok the Shadow is an amazing character. Um, but Dunk is a true knight. And where the King's Guard is supposed to be, it almost never is, but it's supposed to be this great uh, paragon of what knighthood should be about. And Dunk, even though he may well not have been technically a knight at that point, that would be interesting to see when we get there, whether he does at some point admit, oh, I'm actually technically not a knight. Um, but he is a true knight. He goes in and protects... Uh, the vulnerable and uh, the weak and those who can't look after themselves. He, he's got a noble character. We see this from his perspective and he, he doesn't seem to have a, um, a cruel bone in his body or a hurtful bone in his body. He seems like a genuinely good person. So yeah, I would go with Dunk. Um, Icarus Ballerina saying, Lannis says his meetings with Alicent can also benefit Otto. What deal do you think they made and what do you think it is leading to? So, uh, well, that was a really interesting line. There are a few just very short lines in that last couple of episodes um, that uh, will clearly lead on to something in season two. Um, I think we don't know is the boring answer. I th there are two options, one of which is that he's just playing Otto and he's um, there just, he wants Otto to think that he's on his side as well um, because, but he clearly seems to be, then immediately goes out and um, talks about trying to get rid of um, what is effectively Otto's proxy spy network through uh, Masseria. So he doesn't seem to be doing things to help out Otto. So, I mean, perhaps he's there going to try and play some clever game and get on the, both of their sides. But I think in reality, it seems a lot more likely that he is just playing Otto. And Otto, in the book, he will quite soon get replaced as Hand of the King and therefore his stock will fall quite quickly and that's not likely it that if Lance there trying to help him that's not likely that that's the case i think he's there trying to advance alison not otto um c mcbroom could all targ babies be dragged dragon-like during development in the womb we always see dragon features during early labor when babies are 
aren't fully formed. Yeah, it's possible. Um, I mean, I don't think anyone's done a little study of this, but yes, certainly um, early births for Targaryens often do seem to be, the babies do seem to have a lot more draconic features to them. So it's possible. My instinct seems to be that they're either dragonish or not dragonish is the, the answer, rather than that they start a dragon age because there are um, some of the things we're told about, if, I mean, maybe these things aren't true, but some of the things we're told about, it would be quite hard. A tail would have to drop off, wings would have to come off, scales would have to sort of smooth down. They're, they're big changes. So, no, I don't think so. Um, but it's, I mean, it's quite hard to say. It's possible, but I don't think so. A reflective a rambling, picking up a question for Sword of the Morning. Thank you so much. I love it when people do this. Thank you. It's very generous of you, reflective rambling. Um, is it at least possible that Lyanna Stark was being protected and in a relationship with Sir Arthur Dane? And do you think Mithril will protect you from kitten claws? Um, uh, well, Mithril will protect you from uh, stabbed by an orc spear. I think it can protect you from kitten claws. Uh, I think, was is it possible Lyanna Stark was in a relationship with Arthur Dane? I don't know. I, don't, I mean, is it possible? Yes. But the the work that George R. Martin has done, I did a video on this ages and ages and ages ago, of just setting out why um, our, our R plus L equals J is just... I think nearly incontrovertible now, 99% um, certain um, this is what we've got going on. Her being in a relationship with Arthur Dane doesn't really work. Um, so we know that um, Rhaegar was looking for somebody to have a third child with. Um, we know we, we can be pretty certain that he did meet her and he certainly knew her at the tourney at Harren Hall. So there was something going on there. There's no, there's no hint of anything um, uh, between Lyanna and Arthur Dane. So, I mean, this is one of those th the things is that you, you get that the Dane family are so fascinating that they it's very easy to create theories around what they could do but simply the basis of what we know or we're pretty sure they did do i think is good enough for them to be an amazing power. i don't think we need to promote them even further to have some even bigger role so is it possible i mean it's possible but i think it's um it doesn't really fit with the story that georgia martin has been writing so far um Let's have a quick flick through Mighty Migosh saying, first time catching you live. Well, welcome. Uh, great, to, great to see you. Uh, thank you for all the insane amount of high quality content. If we get a new Duncan Egg novella, where do you think they will be? The North, the Riverlands, somewhere else. Okay, so um, he's he said we will, well, we, at some point we will um, get more Duncan Egg. He did start writing. We've got two that he has started writing. Um, the one he's most of the way through is, it has the working title. This won't be its final title, but it's got the working title, The She-Wolves of Winterfell. So that's where that one will be based. Um, then there's another one, which is, um, I'm trying to remember what it's called now, something like The Village Hero, I think was the working title, something like that, which is going to be set in the Riverlands. So um, what he's he has said previously and who knows he's not really been engaged with Duncan Egg for a while now but um, what he said previously is that he saw the first three as a sort of a they were a set and then he's going to do the next three as a sort of a set and uh, yeah so probably the next one will be Winterfell and then the Riverlands and then I mean who knows they're at some point they're going to have to age them up because if he wants to tell the story of Aegon V all the way through to his death, then, um, I mean, how, how many stories can he tell of Egg just as a child? Um, Reflective Rambling saying, do you have a bizarre character, random headcanon such as, I bet Dunk would hate pistachios but love almonds? 
or Beleg is addicted to Elvish Elspin due to tour and fueled headaches. Um, wow, do I have a random uh, character a head cannon? Um, I mean, I don't. Not off the top of my head. I will have a think about that. If I think of one by next week, then I will let you know. That's a um, uh, random and good question, but thank you. Uh, reflective rambling again. Pick up for Amy Smith this time. Thank you very much. Are there any Lord of the Rings characters that ignore their foresight, like in the A Song of Ice and Fire with the Dragon Dreamer, Diran the Drunken? So Diran the Drunken, um, it's, it's, I mean, ignoring it is, is an interesting one. He, he, he gets he gives me the impression of being a bit like what helena is on the show which is that almost everything helena does on the show is either prophetic or prophecy adjacent even um and i did a helena video a week or so ago that was one of the ones i did with um history of westeros and when you start going into it you just see actually almost everything she does you could count as being vaguely prophetic. Even the fact that she's the person who does the dancing on the in on the show in the eve of the dance of the dragons, you could say that that's prophetic. Um, but Deer and the Drunkard has so many of these things going around his head. He just wants them to stop, and that's why he drinks. And that. I feel is like Helena, who just has, I think that increasingly she's going to be getting these in and just wants them to stop. I don't think she's going to turn to drink in the same way that Deron did, but um, I think that uh, she's going to start, it's going to get even more tragic, her story. Um, in terms of Lord of the Rings characters that ignore their foresight, um, I mean, it's quite hard to uh, say, but there is the the astari the maya do have some sort of memories of uh, of things that they can um the echoes of which carry on through into their time in middle earth so they were all there at the um the song of the I know at the creation of everything, and so they have this kind of hazy understanding of of what's going to be happening, um, but that is very kind of hazy, and this is why a part of why Gandalf, who sticks close and true to what he was called to do, he does have this kind of hazy understanding of the future, uh, which you can see when he's there. He basically says, you know, "Gollum has a role yet to play, for good or ill." And he obviously does that kind of thing. But you get characters like, say, Saruman, who clearly have just decided to turn their back on that, not really thinking on uh, that kind of thing. Sauron will have been the same. In terms of um, characters who have foresight, I think one of the things that when I get a chance I want to do a proper study of um, is when characters in The Lord of the Rings say things like, I feel in my heart that... That seems to be Tolkien's way of it's talking about foresight in a way that isn't there, that isn't just this is a big magical thing. And it's some characters do it a lot. Aragorn does it a lot. But some some characters you don't think of as being particularly magical also do this. And uh, oh, Theoden, for example. And they are almost always right. When someone in Tolkien says, I feel in my heart that... They are almost always right. And it's the people who are not listening to their heart that are therefore turning their back on foresight. Um, Andrew Kay, uh, what do we make of the, uh, the rare occurrence of those aggressive dragon hatchlings that attack as soon as they are born? More the fireworm manifest than the dragons uh, were likely mixed with yeah so this is also a thing that occasionally happens is you get a um a dragon egg that hatches and the baby dragon is immediately starts attacking um i think what do we make of it i think it's just george R. martin reminding us that dragons are not pets dragons cannot be tamed um you there, there's this, it seems like the Targaryens almost mythologize their, their link with dragons by having 
with dragon eggs in cradles and you just think well, you can't control these dragons do you really want that baby dragon in in a cradle with a baby um so i i what i think is that we we read about it a couple of times in the Targaryen history and off that they're, they're killed but i think that's if they survive, they turn into something like Cannibal, uh, the dragon on uh, Dragonstone, um, that just grew bigger and older and more fierce. Martin S., do you think Grond the Battering Ram would have broken the gate of Minas Tirith on its own, or was it the Witch King's dark sorcery required? I mean, it's a bit of both. So there was there was sort of some sort of dark sorcery going on with Grond as well. Um, but what we what we read is that um, the Witch King, before the Battle of the Pelennor Fields, the Witch King reported back to Sauron, Sauron, Sauron and he basically got a power-up, and Sauron just boosted his power uh, and sent him in. So would um, the gates of Minas Tirith have fallen eventually? Well, yes, eventually they would. They, weren't, they were very big and strong, powerful gates, but it there wasn't this huge enchantment preventing anyone getting in there. Um, all the artsy saying, if Morgoth's disturbance to Uru's song was just always a part of the plan, why was he punished for it? Might as well ask why Lucifer was struck down. Huh? Yeah, exactly. This is Tolkien reflecting Christian theology within, um, and, and indeed kind of, Miltonian theology within the his own universe. Um, Thomas de Kirschmecker saying, Hi, Robert, where will Bran move next and how? A boat on the Underground River uh, or via Weirwood Tunnels? Castle Black, Nightfort, Door. Will he head for Winterfell, King's Landing or the Isle of Faces? Um, well, it's, it's interesting. I think he will escape underground. Um, the, with the amount of times we've been told about underground tunnels under the, the wall and things like that. So I don't think he needs to go back through the, uh, the night fort again. I think he can go under the wall. I think that he will end up back in Winterfell. He may well, I mean, and this would be pretty epic was that if he ended up in the Winterfell crypts and came up that way, uh, that would work um, pretty astonishing. Uh, but yeah, I think he's going to end up escaping through the tunnels. Um, let's uh, have another couple of questions. Um, uh Nate Davis saying, will Arya and Bran warg and take control of Nymeria's wolf pack to help fight the others at the Trident? Um, so the wolf pack will have a role. The, the main role for, and this is one of the things George Martin has actually very clearly and specifically said, he, he's he talked about um, uh, Chekhov's wolf pack, uh, the super pack of wolves. It, it will have a role. I think it will have a role at least to start with in the Winds of Winter, in the Riverlands, and they are already seeking out the enemies of the Starks. So, and I think this will happen regardless of um, Arya walking into Nymeria in particular. The bond is so strong that they, Nymeria is already hunting down the enemies of the Starks. So, yes, no, uh, Arya will occasionally walk into Nymeria, but it's not to, to control Nymeria and guide her to be doing things. It's just uh, coming along for the ride. That's basically what has been happening with, our, with Arya with her wolf dreams. She's just been coming along for the ride. I do wonder whether um, what, what happens with uh, on, on the show, Arya came in and killed all the Freys. Uh, all by herself, um, which looked epic. But I do wonder whether in the books we're going to be left with a situation where we have um, the super pack of wolves attack the twins, and it's the wolves that take down uh, the 
uh, the phrase that that I think would be an astonishing. Uh, there's probably some foreshadowing it for it actually if you're looking um, uh, for it all the way back in the game that um, Bran and Rickon play with the big and little Walder. Um, but I think that the super pack of wolves will be taking out a lot of the phrase. Um, question from Steve Owen. Is it valid to read um, House of the Dragon as a struggle between Targaryen culture and religion versus a Westerosi cultural absorption or assimilation of Targaryenism? Um, yes, it is. I mean, one thing that they have very clearly tried to set this up as um, Team Valyrian against Team Westerosi culture. That's something that, and they can't do this fully because clearly uh, Team Green has to have dragon riders and things like that. But Damon has been set up as this arch Valyrian character. He is he's the most Valyrian character we've got. He talks in High Valyrian a lot. He's the person who goes out and gathers the dragon eggs and he sings to the dragons. Um, he gives gifts to Valyrian steel necklaces to, to Rhaenyra. He has a Valyrian steel sword. He acts very tar Targaryen-y all the time. He is the arch Valyrian character. They got married, the two of them, him and Rhaenyra, got married in a Valyrian ceremony. So that is Team Valyria. And when they came across to King's Landing in Viserys's last, last days, it was very clear that you, you see the imagery and you get Alicent with her Faith of the Seven necklace around her neck. And a lot of the Targaryen and dragony stuff has been taken down. That is, and who's there in positions of power? It's the High Septon, or the Septons and the Maesters, and the High Towers of the oldest family in Westeros. So this is, they are setting this up to be like that. And it's almost as if they are trying to have a sanitized version of the Targaryens through the High Towers. That certainly seems to be what it is compared to the more wild and free version of the terror of the Targaryens under Daemon and Rhaenyra. So yes, um, it's I think that's a perfectly reasonable um, way to uh, interpret that. Um, okay, I think with that, um, what I will say is that uh, next week, I'm going to take a week off from the live streams. I, I work very hard on the, uh, both doing both TV shows at the same time. And uh, it's always good to um, Take a break, look after yourself. So that's what I'm going to do next week. I'm going to take a week off from this, but I will be back in two weeks' time. Uh, I'll make sure a couple of videos come out during uh, that time so you won't be bereft of any content from me. But I'll be back with the live streams in two weeks' time. Um, and in the meantime, if you're watching this back a little bit later, there will be a link appearing here to other live streams, and there will be a link appearing here to my Patreon page, which is the best way to support this channel if you wish to do so. Um, thank you, patrons. Uh, thank you so much, uh, moderators as well. And again, I said at the beginning, if you donated to the um, uh, to the charity streams all the way through the seasons, thank you. Your, your support is hugely appreciated and will make a massive difference. So thanks, everyone. Take care, and I shall see you again soon.